Judges chapter 16, a familiar character in the scriptures, uh, one that at times was looked at as a hero, but then at other times a disgrace. We'll begin our reading verse number 4 of Judges 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass afterwards that he, Samson, loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, I don't know how many of them there were, but every one of them was going to give her 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, look down at verse 16. And it came to pass, when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart, and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite of God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep, and said, I will go out as as other times before, and shake myself, and he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him, and put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza, and bound him with feathers of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the real good singing, Lord. Lord, uh, your touch was on the singing, and Lord, our hearts were blessed. We thank you for the good testimonies. Lord, we thank you for being a great God that hears and answers prayer. Now, Father, help us from the Word of God tonight. Open our eyes, Lord, to your truths. Prick our hearts, uh, Lord, with your conviction. And God, change us and transform us into thy likeness. May we truly be vessels of honor, meet for the Master's use. And God, may we truly impact our world for the cause of Christ. Oh Lord, it's amazing how, Lord, a, a football team can energize a city. Lord, I ponder and wonder what a church set on fire from God could do to a country. So God, help us send revival, and God will certainly bless you, praise you, and glorify you for all the great things that you do. For it's in the wonderful and holy name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to notice three things about Samson. I want you to notice, first of all, that Samson ignored some things. Can I say, first of all, that verse number 4, he said, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now go back with me just a page or so to chapter 14. Look in verse number 2. The Bible says, And he came up and told his father and his mother, and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people? that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord, and he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over him. 
He ignored some things, my dear friends. First of all, he ignored uh, his uh, uh, parents. He ignored their advice. Uh, he ignored uh, 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 the warnings from his parents uh, not to take a wife uh, from another people. Uh, can I say, uh, my dear friends, a lot of people get themselves in trouble when they ignore the advice of their parents. Uh, can I say, uh, 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 your parents have lived a little bit longer than you. Uh, they've faced a little bit uh, more than you. Uh, uh, they know a little bit more than you. Uh, and friends, they want you to learn uh, from their wisdom. Uh, uh, listen to me, children. Uh, I know sometimes you think mom and dad uh, or grandma and grandpa's just old fuddy-duddy. Uh, they don't want you to have any fun. Uh, they don't want you to enjoy what you want to enjoy. Uh, but friend, they've done seen the end of that thing. Uh, they already understand if you keep going down that path, uh, it doesn't end well for you. Uh, and when they tell you no, uh, you ought to be thankful you got a mom and dad uh, or a grandma and grandpa Grandpa, uh, that knows the word no uh, and uh, uh, cares enough about you to not let you to go after your own constraints uh, but cares enough about you uh, to tell you some things that will help your life. Uh, can I say he ignored the warnings of his parents. Now the woman he wanted there was not Delilah. Matter of fact, uh, you read on through chapter 14, chapter 15, you're going to find Samson had a real woman problem. Mm. Now Samson's a judge in Israel, mm, but he's got his eyes on Philistine women. Mm. Can I say he not only ignored the warnings of his parents, he ignored the word of God. God told Moses uh, to not go and take brides uh, uh, for, your, for your boys uh, or husbands for your daughters uh, from other nations, but ignored the word of God. Can I say, nor the will of God. It was not the will of God for a judge of Israel to be hanging out with this wicked woman, Delilah. It is never God's will for God's people to sin. Mm. And Samson's guilty of fornication. That wasn't the will of God. So he ignored some things. Mm. Can I say... Every child of God whose life ends up in a mess ends up in a mess because they've ignored the Word of God and the will of God. Mm? And also probably many warnings from God. Mm? You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. Could I say something else about Samson? He not only ignored, Samson became irritated. Look at verse 16 of chapter 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Another word for vexed is irritated. He was so irritated with her constantly nagging him about the source of his strength. He was so irritated he thought he was at the point of death. Mm -hmm. He became irritated. He ignored but then notice something else about Samson. He was incognizant. You say, what does that mean? That means he was unaware. He was incognizant. Look at verse 20. And she said, The Philistines be, Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Can I say there's been many Christians that have ignored the warnings of God, the will of God, the Word of God. Then they become irritated to the point uh, where they'll sell out the things of God, uh, and then they become incognizant to where they're not even aware that God's touching it in their life anymore. They get so far out of the will of God, they don't even recognize that God's nowhere near them. And my dear friends, when you get to that point, you're living in your own strength. You're making decisions by your own design. You are breaking the hedge of God and inviting trouble into your life. Can I say the sin of Samson cost him greatly? Can I say, first of all, it cost him the power from God? 
Listen, there's no substitute for the power of God. Right now as we assemble here tonight, Russia's building a campaign against Ukraine. Can I say Russia has a mighty army? Can I say China has a mighty army? Can I say the United States of America have mighty armies? But can I say this? All those armies combined can't come close to matching the power of God. Mm -mm. But sin will cost the power of God from your life. Can I say sin cost Samson his position with God? He was the judge of Israel. He was the most important voice in Israel, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. There's been many of folks that used to be preachers, used to be teachers, used to be deacons, used to serve the church in other capacities, uh, but sin cost them their position. Can I say sin cost Samson his pupils? They gouged out his eyeballs. Hmm? Can I say? Sin will affect how you look at things. Hmm? Sin cost him his personal testimony. Anytime you hear anybody mention Samson, the next thing is Delilah. I don't hear Samson carried the great gates of the Philistines. I don't hear that. Samson burn up all their barley fields by setting foxes' tails on fire. I don't hear that Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. I don't hear all that. I don't hear that he tore a lion in half with his bare hands. I don't hear that. But I hear about Delilah. Uh, the great king of Israel, David, and all that he done for Israel. Uh, man after God's own heart. Uh, uh, the one that uh, uh, penned most of the Psalms. Uh, uh, the one that, uh, 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 my dear friends, that even Israel today looks to David. But you mentioned David, and boy, you hear Bathsheba. Hmm? Listen. Uh, sin, of course, you your personal testimony. You know all that you really have between you and God is your testimony? Can I say sin will cost you your peace? Hmm? Can you imagine Samson down there in the prison house day in and day out with his eyeballs gouged out and him uh, chained and little children leading him out to grind in the mill house? Can you imagine how much sleep he lost? How much regret he had in his life? Can you imagine him going back and listening to his parents' warnings now? It cost you your peace. It also cost him his pride. It cost him his dignity. Here's the champion of Israel, and a little child's leading him out, and they're spitting on him and laughing at him and mocking him and making sport of him. Mm hmm. I know people that have blown their testimony, allowed sin to wreck their lives. I pleaded with them to come to church. They say, Preacher, I can't go back to church because people recognize me. I'm not what I used to be. The very dignity that they used to have is gone and they can't face people with it. Even though God's people would willingly embrace them, even though God himself would willingly forgive them, they can't forgive themselves. Mm -hmm. Now let me say something about sin. Sin comes because the devil sets a snare. And I say the devil will find you, friend. Do not think you are exempt from the devil. Uh, we have an adversary as a roaring lion who walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is on your trail whether or not you know it. Mm -hmm. he'll find you he'll wine and dine you like Delilah did Samson mm -hmm. he knows how to whisper the very thing you need to hear in your ears to get you to mess up mm -hmm. he'll blind you like he did Samson mm -hmm. hey he'll bind you like they did Samson and then he'll grind you to a powder like they did Samson Samson thought he knew what he needed and it cost him everything he had. Hmm? I'd have preached for a little while tonight on this little thought, and I did not get this from the Jungle Book. But Th Samson thought he knew what he needed. 
I ought to preach on the necessities of life. I ought to preach on the very things you do need. What is necessary above all other things. Now listen, I understand a little bit. I understand you need to eat. You need food. I understand you need to drink. You need water for your life. I understand you need a job because you've got to buy food and water. I understand you need a place, uh, a roof over your head. Uh, and as Brother Clint already sang that we're blessed, shoes on your feet, clothes on your back. I understand you have need of those things, but those are not the necessities of your life. Those are byproducts of what you really need. Hmm? Can I say, first of all, the greatest necessities of everybody's life is Christ. Uh, the Bible seek, says, uh, but seek you first uh, the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all those other things uh, will be added unto you. Uh, without Christ, you can't go to glory. Uh, without Christ, you don't know what peace is. Uh, without Christ, you have no pardon of your sins. Uh, without Christ, you have no strength uh, uh, to uh, overcome any obstacle you face. Uh, without Christ, you have no song. Uh, without Christ, you have no joy. Uh, without Christ, you have no hope. Uh, the greatest need of everybody's life is Jesus Christ, uh, His Lord and Savior. Uh, He's your greatest necessity. Mm. Uh, from Him is where all blessings come from. They all flow from Christ. Uh, the hymn we sang, uh, uh, the, or the song uh, 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 Brother uh, Phil sang about Him holding our soul in His hand. Do you realize He carved out the waters of this world in His hand? Uh, he's the one that controls everything, including the weather. Mm. He knows your down sitting, your uprising, knows the number of the hairs on your head, knows your thoughts, intents of your heart, knows everything about you, and still chooses to deal with you. We need Christ. Without Christ, our life is miserable. The greatest necessities of everybody's life is Christ. Can I say, secondly, the greatest necessities of life? Not only Christ, but a church. Everyone needs a church. Mm. Why do you think God left the church here? Huh? Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, why do you think Jesus' last commandment before he ascended to heaven uh, was to his disciples to go and preach the gospel everywhere? Because uh, he knew everyone needed a church. Uh, it's a necessity of our life. Church isn't just an option. Church just isn't an organization. Church isn't just something we do because we don't have anything else to do. Church is our lifeline to God. Uh, when I speak of church, friends, I'm talking about a Bible preaching church. There are a lot of things that call themselves churches, but they don't open the Bible. They don't preach God's truth. Uh, they don't uh, give you what you need for your life. Everyone needs a Bible preaching church. Uh, can I say not only a Bible preaching church, but a Bible practicing church? Uh, it's one thing to proclaim, it's another thing to live by it. Another thing to practice the truths contained within the Bible. Another thing to have a church that stands on the truths. Uh, there are a lot of them out there will tell you what they think you should do, but they don't live it. We need a Bible preaching church, we need a Bible practicing church, and we need a Bible praising church. A church that knows how to worship church that knows how to glorify God in their worship, uh, a church that knows how to lift up their voice uh, uh, as a sweet smelling savor unto God, uh, a church that's not afraid uh, for folks to raise their hands and say bless the Lord oh my soul, uh, all that is within me bless the Lord, uh, a church that's not afraid to say we love Jesus uh, because he first loved us uh, it's a necessity of life, church thank God for the church where would we be without our church? Amen. If you're honest, some of your best friends in the world's in his church. Sure. Mm. Uh, folks you depend on, folks you count on. Folks, when you're down, they'll help lift you up. Folks, when you have a need, that'll pray for you. Uh, that'll help meet the need. Uh, where would we be without our church family? Thank Amen. God for a church. Uh, we're fitly framed together. God brought us together to worship him and to get the gospel out. Thank God for church. It's one of the greatest necessities of your life. We need Christ. We need a church. Another great necessity of your life is commitment. How come commitment 
is not even questioned throughout the world except when it comes to your church life. We expect a commitment when we get married. You're committed one to another. When you have children, there's a commitment expected that you're going to take care of your children. You just don't have them and leave them out in the yard. So see you when you're about 18. There's a commitment there. When Brother Charlie joined the Navy, there was a commitment. He signed some paperwork uh, saying, I'm going to be committed to the Navy. And the Navy said, we're going to be committed to you. There's commitment there. When you went to work on your job, you entered into a commitment. Uh, they expected you to do some work, uh, and they would pay you for it. Uh, and hopefully give you some benefits and treat you good. There's commitment. Uh, when you get in your car to leave here tonight, there's commitment. Uh, you're committed to keep the laws uh, of driving, and you're trusting everybody else on the road is going to be committed to do the same. There's commitment everywhere. But if you tell folks you're going to be committed to God and committed to church, they think you're crazy. It's the greatest necessity. One of the great ones. Commitment. If you're committed to your spouse, then you should be. If you're committed to your children, you should be. If you're committed to your job, you should be. If you're committed to society, you should be. Why less would you be committed to Christ? Hmm? And I say... You ought to be committed to serving Christ. It's a necessity in your life. Uh, for all he's done for us, it's a joy to serve him. You ought to be committed to that. You ought to be committed to studying the Bible. I'm amazed at how many people go to church and they don't know anything about the Bible. It's sad. Listen, if all your Bible study is what you get in church, you're a weak Christian. I'm thankful for our teachers. I'm thankful for our preachers. You will learn coming to church. But all that should do is whet your appetite for your own personal study. You ought to learn to study the Bible. I'm amazed when I give them one of the minor prophets as a text how long it takes some of you to find it. Some of you have learned a secret. You go to the first few pages, it'll tell you what page it's on. Uh, you ought to be committed to studying the Bible. Why? You're going to be judged by it. Amen. But more important than that, in the Bible you'll find life. You'll find hope. You'll find strength. In the Bible you'll find what it takes to overcome the snares of the devil. Right. In the Bible you'll find something that will spark you on your job where the Holy Ghost shows up and you're weeping on the job and you can't stop it. Uh, that doesn't happen when you're not in the Bible. That doesn't happen when you're in the newspaper, not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You ought to be committed to serving Christ and studying the Bible. You ought to be committed to supplication, to prayer. You only be as strong as a Christian as your prayer life is. Mm -hmm. Throughout the Scriptures, we're exhorted to pray. Mm -hmm. Prayers where we talk to God. He talks to us through the Bible. And your prayer life is so valuable. It's more valuable than gold, friend. Prayer is what touches heaven. Do you know your prayers are so important that God records and keeps every one? Go study the book of Revelation. There are vials full of the prayers of the saints. God keeps them all. You ought to be committed to your prayer life. Why? You never know when somebody's going to depend on you touching heaven for them. Yeah. Hmm? I'm talking about the greatest necessities of everybody's life. Christ, a church, commitment, but also character. Well, I didn't say you need to be a character. There's enough of them running around. You need to have character. Not much of that in this day and age. Used to, folks had character. Used to, your newsmen had character. Used to, your politicians had character. Used to, people in positions of authority had character. Used to, preachers had character. Used to, people sitting in the church house had character. 
But as time goes on, we're finding that waning more and more and more. And if you believe everything comes out of a politician's mouth or everything on the news media, you, my dear friend, have been hoodwinked. Hmm. I got to thinking about character. You know, a lot of people don't even know what character is. Let me give you some quotes I found on character. I like this quote. It says, reputation is merely what others think, of you, think you are. Character is what you really are. Hmm? You can fool others. You can't fool God. Amen. Character is doing the right thing when nobody is looking. Then I thought about this. Solid character will reflect itself in consistent behavior while poor character will seek to hide behind deceptive words and actions. The Bible has a verse for that. It simply works meet for repentance. I can come and tell you I'm sorry I let you down, but if I don't back that up with actions, it's just idle words. It's not character. True character is backed up by your actions. Mm -mm. There are so many people that will tell you what they think you need to hear. But they don't back it up. Have you ever been in a church service where somebody stood up and said, If I've ever done anything to offend you, please forgive me. You ever heard somebody say that? I've heard that. Hogwash. First of all, if you've done something to offend somebody, you know it. Because the Holy Ghost done told you. Right. Mm. If he hadn't told you, then you haven't offended anybody, or you're not listening to him, or you're not saved. Huh? But that's a cop out. Anybody got anything on your heart, preacher? I want to thank God I'm saved. And if I've ever done anything to offend anybody, I want the church to know I'm sorry. Hogwash. You know what character is? Brother Clint, I, I know I let you down, and I'm sorry I failed your, your, your confidence in me. And if you'll give me another chance, by the grace of God, I'll never let you down again. Please forgive me. That's character, and then they live the rest of their life not to let him down. That's character. That's something that's real. That's not telling somebody what you think they want to hear. That's being committed to character. Hmm? And listen, when somebody has character and comes and asks for forgiveness, it makes you desire to want to forgive them. And then you pull for them. But when somebody says that other mess, that disgusts you. You think, oh, yeah, just wait. About three weeks, they're going to get up and say the same thing again. Because they didn't really mean it. Huh? Character's a necessity of life. You know why the world doesn't flock into the church? Because they've seen characters. They haven't seen character. Most people out there tell you, I don't want to go to church. A bunch of hypocrites there. You know why? Because they haven't seen character. You know, if they see character, folks that are real, you know what they'll want? What we have. They'll say, that's a lifestyle worth living. Character is a necessity. I thought of this lastly. The necessities of life. You need a cause. When David came to deliver the supplies to his brothers, his father sent him down there and he came and he brought the supplies and Goliath's out there cursing God and cursing the armies of Israel. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defieth the armies of God? He says, is there not a cause? Sure. He went on to say, I'll take him on. Why did David do what the whole army of Israel couldn't do? He had a cause. Yeah. Hmm. You know why we don't have revival? We don't have a cause. You know why we don't impact this world? We don't have a cause. We need a cause. It's a necessity. If the church is going to 
a, a continue and the church is going to impact this world for Christ, we need a cause. You say, what are you talking about? What's a cause? A cause, first of all, is a motivation to please God above all others. When your motivation is serves, we would see Jesus. When your motivation is uh, uh, Christ, and then everything else fall in order, you'll have a cause. It's a motivation. You get out of bed, your motivation ought to be, I'm going to please Christ today. On your job, your motivation ought to be, I hope my boss is pleased with me, but more importantly, I hope Christ is pleased with me. In your uh, 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 marriage, in your home, I, I hope my kids, I hope my wife's pleased with me, uh, but more importantly, I want Christ to be pleased with me. He ought to be your motivation. He ought to be your cause. But a cause is also a meaning to overcome your obstacles. Goliath was a great obstacle. David said, is there not a cause? Hmm? And then Saul tried to put his armor on him. He said, no, I'll just take what I've proven. You know what will help you to overcome your obstacles? Not what Joel Osteen will tell you. Not what somebody else wants to put on you. What will help overcome your obstacles, what Christ has put in you, your cause, uh, the things you have proven, the Bible will overcome uh, your obstacles. Uh, praise will overcome your obstacles. Uh, Christ will overcome your obstacles. Those things that you have proven will overcome your obstacles. Hmm. Why should I depend on you to pray for me when I can get on my knees and pray for me? Amen. Those things. God, I need your help. Those things you've proven, that's your cause. Huh? It's a meaning to overcome your obstacles. But I thought of another cause. It's a mindset to witness to the loss. You know what will keep your testimony intact when you realize there's lost people all around you and you have a mindset, I have a cause to live right because I need to be a light to these folks and I need to tell them about Jesus. Hmm? When your cause is a burden for sinners... When your cause is a burden to please Christ, when your cause is the very burden that propels you above anything that comes against you, it's real. If your cause leads you to nothing but excuses, it's not real. Hmm? Let me help you something. I'm about to wind this up. Let me help you. Something. Everybody in here had an excuse not to be here tonight. The weatherman has been telling us since Sunday. White death is coming. Initially, they said 9 o'clock Wednesday night. Now they pushed back to midnight. Then I heard that at 2 in the morning, it's still supposed to be 47. We're not getting ice if it's 47 degrees. Just helping you. Huh? Brother Ray's finally bought into my philosophy. If they forecast it, you don't have to worry about it. We found that out last week. They didn't forecast it. We got snow. But, but here's the thing. Even if it wasn't white death, it is a nasty night. You know, I just live a couple miles away, and driving in, the rain was so bad, and the lights hitting the rain, you couldn't see the lines on the road, and it was, it's a nasty night. It had been a good night to say, you know what, I'm just going to watch live stream tonight. But something propelled you to face rain, to face white death, to come on out to church tonight, most of you because you really needed to hear something from heaven. Some of you have been sick and you missed it so bad you couldn't wait to get back. You can see the excuse didn't wait. Didn't weigh on you. Because you had a cause. Huh? You know why some people have no problem pulling out that checkbook and writing their ties every Sunday? Because they have a cause. It's never a struggle because that's what's right to do. You know that is perpetuating the gospel going forth. You know why some people have no problem opening their Bible and reading about Jesus? They have a cause. But if you're constantly making excuses why you can't, it's because you need a cause that's real. Because whatever it is, isn't working for you. Now listen. If we have these necessities, Christ, church, commitment, a cause, character, these necessities, when they become our focus, the Lord does for us what we cannot do. You know what He does? He supplies our needs. Every need supplied. 
Mm. I don't have to worry about going and finding a job where I can make enough money, where I can take care of all my bills and do all that. If I put these five necessities in my life, and there are many other necessities in the Bible, but if I'll take these five necessities uh, and make them a, a, a part of my life, Christ being first, uh, uh, my dear friends, He has promised to supply my needs. Hmm? Can I say this? He'll not only supply our needs, He also secures us. He takes care of us. Even when it's raining. Even when it's snowing. Even when we got ice and snow and we take out a lamp post, He still meets our needs and He still takes care of us. Now, don't throw off on her about hitting that lamp post last week and damaging her car. Have you heard the rest of the story? If she don't hit the lamp post, right on the other side of it was a pond. Aren't you glad the Lord neither slumbers nor sleeps? Hmm? Uh, I hate she wrecked her car, but I'm glad the Lord had a lamp post right where it needed to be. Hmm? But He takes care of us. He secures us now and for all of eternity. And when we seek these necessities, He also satisfies us. Hmm? You see, when Jesus asked his disciples after many had listened to him and went away, he said, will you two go away? They said, where will we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. They were satisfied in what Christ had said. Huh? He satisfies us. Huh? You know why? And I can start right here and go around the building. of Folks that have been here for years and years. I mean, Thad had dark hair. You know, Ray had hair. And we can go on for years. You know why they're still here? They don't need to go look somewhere else. They're satisfied here. God's doing what needs to be done in their life here. Huh? You know, uh, God bless her, Miss Carol. She used to be worried to death when I'd go preach revival, go to meetings. You know, she's down there at Baptist Village now, but Miss Carol, she was always, when I'd come back, she said, Oh, we missed you. I was afraid you wouldn't come back. She was always afraid I was going to get down there and somebody else was going to offer me a church. She was always worried about it. And I kept telling her, I said, Miss Carol, Dorothy said it best. There's no place like home. Hmm. Huh? You know why I always come back? There's no place like home. There's no church like this church. Huh? There's no home like at 8731 Heritage Drive. Huh? I always come home. Huh? Why? Because this is home. I'm satisfied. Huh? You know how many churches I've candidated for since I've been pastor here? Zero. Can I help you something? I didn't even candidate for this church. Hmm? Ken Ponder came looking for me. Huh? I didn't candidate for the first church I pastored. Huh? I've just learned God takes care of all that stuff. I just need to hang out where He wants me to hang out. It all happens. Huh? But I'm satisfied. I don't need to look for anywhere else. Look to someone else. I don't need to look at a new Bible. The one I got is just fine. I'm satisfied. Huh? I don't need to look for a new way to worship. I like the old paths. Huh? I don't need to look for more talent. We got enough talent here to choke a goat. Are you listening? To, I don't need to look for anything else other than Him, my dear friends. He's the one that satisfies. Hmm? So I encourage you. Embrace and long for the things that are most needed in your life. The necessities. Those things you can't live without. You seek those things. Everything else be just fine. God's always taking care of His own. Just, just keep, keep Him the main thing. You keep Jesus the main thing, everything else is going to be fine. Samson, he got way off because he thought he needed something that he didn't need. Oh, if we just learn that old course, Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All, all I need. If we just embrace that, you'll never go astray, friend. 
you'll just remain where God wants you to remain. Let's all stand tonight. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Maybe you want to come and thank him for being so good to you. Maybe he spoke to your heart about something. You want to come and talk to him about it. Maybe you just want to tell him you love him. I don't know. We're going to give you that opportunity. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Help us to embrace the necessities of life. Help us to certainly represent you to this lost and dying world in the correct light. And God, certainly bless these, your people. Help us, Lord, in our shortcomings. Lord, strengthen us beyond our own comprehension. Now, bless this invitation. Speak to hearts. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.